Praise the Lord, everybody. Get this thing, get this thing turned on. So thankful for the touch of the Lord that I feel in this place tonight. I had a thought, and I asked them Monday night to pray for me at prayer meeting because I've had a thought and been trying to get it together, Sister Judy, and it's, it's, it's a simple thought, but it applies to you and I. Matter of fact, it is you and I. I want to talk to you for a little while tonight about the church. About the church. Uh, I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20, uh, a very familiar passage of Scripture, quoted quite often. But uh, I want to talk to us about the church. The purpose of the church, what the church involves. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20 says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood had not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Not going to stop it. Not going to prevail against it, Brother Billy. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and through 5 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringeth into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And I want to speak on the church tonight. A church that is positioned in a place that the Lord wants us to be. We are here for a reason. We are here for a purpose. A church that has been described through the scriptures as the bride of Christ as the glorious church, as a peculiar people, as a royal priesthood, a chosen generation, a redeemed church, a conquering church, the salt of the earth, the light of the world, and a blood-bought church. He bought us by his blood, Brother Doyle, a blood-bought church. When we think of church, we often think of the singing, we think of the worship, and we think of the preaching as the primary functions of the church. Good things happen to people at church. Amen? Through the church, you and I have received the revelation of who God is by the power of the Holy Ghost. And others will, will continue to receive the power of the Holy Ghost through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that Brother Gio has taught to us over and over again that we should know by heart now. There's healings that take place at church. There's reconciliation that happens at church. People being brought back together not only with God, but with other people. Lives are put back together. Things are changed when you come to church. Personal development in which we grow stronger in the Lord in a spiritual direction in which the Lord wants us to take. Brother Rice says coming to church, Brother Pete, keeps your mind in the right place. It's important that we come to church. It's important that we realize, Brother Billy, that we are the church. We are the church. Going to church should be a, the number one priority in our lives. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25, he said, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. The day that he's talking about is the coming of the Lord. 
How many of you believe we're closer than we've ever been? Signs of the time point to the coming of the Lord. There's not a, really another prophecy in the Bible that has to be fulfilled before he can come back and rapture his church. It's the prayers of the saints that's holding him back. We should encourage one another. We should love one another. Encourage one another to come to church. It's important. And I believe the coming of the Lord's not that far off. The original word for church is ecclesia, E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A, and it simply refers to a group of called out people for the purpose of reflecting his marvelous light into a world of darkness. We live in a dark world right now. The devil's at work and we live in a dark world. There's evil things that are happening into our world right now. But Matthew 15, 14 through 16 says, Ye are the light of the world. The city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. He said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. See our good works. See the church's good works. And glorify our Father which is in heaven. Jesus declared in this passage of scripture that I read tonight that he would build his church on the strong foundation of his identity and that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It's not going to stop it. It's not going to, it's not going to stand in the way of the purpose of the church that God died for, that he gave his life for. It's not going to stop it. Images are representations of the real. We see pictures that have been taken of, of people, and they are a representation of real life, if you will, a shadow of authentic or an artist's conception of an actual building. The same way God's church should project his image, his holiness, his righteousness, his mind, his will, and his power. Reflecting the nature of God should be as natural as as a process, as a man standing in front of a mirror and it's reflecting his image or her image. It should be that easy that we reflect the image of God just like a mirror will reflect our image into it. Church is a place of change. How many, how many of you ever had your life changed at church? Church is a place of change. Jacob had a meeting with God in the Old Testament after he fled from Esau. And he falls asleep on a stone and he has this vision of these angels, of this ladder stretched from heaven to earth. And these angels are going up and down this ladder, descending from heaven to the earth. And they're back and forth. And the Lord is standing at the top of it. And he tells him that he's going to bless him, that he's going to take care of him. Now, this sucker had just stole the birthright from his brother. And he's fleeing for his life. And he finds himself in a place where he's laid his head on a rock and God starts talking to him. And he calls the place Bethel. He said he awoke and he said, surely, surely God was in this place and I knew it not. And he named that place Bethel, which means house of God. Years later, after he goes and he works for Laban for the 14 years and he gets Rebecca and Leah as his wives and he's coming back. He's coming back to meet Esau and the Lord brings him back to this same place, this same place called Bethel, this, this place that he named House of God, and he brings Jacob back to the same place. And we know the story. It was there that he wrestled with an angel all night long, refusing to let go. He said, I will not let go until you bless me. I will not let go until something is changed. And he named the place the second time El Bethel, which means the God of the house of God. God has summoned him to that place of meeting a second time for the purpose of changing his name, for the purpose of changing Jacob from who he originally was. He left El Bethel as the one who had power with God rather than a surplanter or a trickster. He had been Jacob the deceiver, and now he was Israel, and he had power with God. God changed him, Brother Billy, at a place that he named the house of God. A meeting with God will change an individual. No longer will his or her past define who they are 
But when they repent of their sins, they're baptized in Jesus' name, and they receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, they become the children of God. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We're different characters. We are different individuals when we are filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. No longer do we have to let our past define who we are. No longer do we have to let our past stand in the way. Amen. We've got a brand new life. A brand new life that God has made a change in. I've shared this story with you again, but the Lord brought it back to my mind. And we'll share with you again. Uh, it's a story about... It talks about the change that I'm talking about, the change that takes place in an individual. I want to share a story about the change. I'm speaking of Nicky Cruz was three and a half years old when his heart was turned to stone. As one of 18 children born to witchcraft practicing parents from Puerto Rico, bloodshed and mayhem were common occurrences in his life. He suffered severe physical and mental abuse at his parents' hands. At one time being declared the son of Satan by his mother while she was in a trance. When he was 15, Nicky's father sent him to visit an older brother in New York City. But Nicky didn't stay with his brother for very long. Full of anger and rage, he chose to make it on his own. He was tough but lonely. And by the age of 16, he became a member of the notorious Brooklyn Street Gang known as the Maui Mauis which were named after a bloodthirsty African tribe. Within six months, Nicky became their president. Nicky fiercely ruled the streets as the warlord of one of the most dreaded and hated gangs of New York, both by the rivals and by the police of that city. Lost in a cycle of drugs, alcohol, and brutal violence, Nicky's life took a tragic turn for the worse after a friend of his and fellow gang member was stabbed and beaten, and he died in Nicky's arms. As Nicky's reputation grew, so did his haunting nightmares, arrested countless and countless times. A court-ordered psychiatrist pronounced Nicky Cruz's fate as headed to prison, the electric chair, and then hell, all in that order. He told him, that was, that's what's going to happen to you, Nicky. You're going to go to prison, you're going to go to the electric chair, and then you're going to go to hell. No authority figure could reach Nicky Cruz until he met a skinny street preacher named David Wilkerson. He got, through to by, he got through to Nicky by showing him something that he had never seen before, a relentless love. His interest in Nicky Cruz was persistent. Nicky beat him up. Nicky spit on him. And on one occasion, he seriously threatened his life, Sister Eloise. He, he hated this man of God. But, but David just kept coming back to him. He kept coming back to him. He began to show him what the love of God was all about. The love of God remained stronger than any adversary Nicky Cruz had ever encountered. Finally, Wilkerson's presentation and demonstration of the gospel message of love and that promise of, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, melted the thick walls of Nicky Cruz's heart. Nicky received forgiveness and gave his life to God and the love that can only come through Jesus Christ. Since then, he has been dedicated his own life to helping others that were like him to find freedom from the chains of sin. David Wilkerson had a, a, a series of books, The Cross and the Switchblade, uh, Between the Cross and the Switchblade, in which this story is told. I read it as a young boy years and years ago. And we say, we say what an awesome story that is. What an awesome thing that God did in his life and set him free from whatever had him bound. But you and I were just as lost as Nicky Cruz. You and I, Brother Terry, was just as lost as this young man. Our life might not have been involved in the same type of lifestyle that he had, or as in deep in sin that he was, but we needed a change in our own lives when we came to God. We still needed to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And we found it at an altar. We found it at a place called The Church. When the Bible speaks of his church, he's not talking about a building. It's not this building. As Brother G.L. said, we have church in here, but church is to be taken outside of the walls of this building. That's where church things happen. That's where church takes place at, if you will. 
It's a group of believers called out for a purpose of spreading the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And what really, really excites me about this is that we're all born into the same body. We all are filled with the same Holy Ghost. Yeah. We're all kindred spirit. There's nothing that I can do that you can't do because we all have the same power of the Holy Ghost working in us. We can all make a difference in the world in which we live because we all have the same Holy Ghost. We all serve the same God, Brother McKinney. He's not changed. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13 says, For as the body is one and had many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free and have been all made to drink into one spirit. We are all born into one family. Jesus sent his disciples out to minister, directing them to perform amazing acts and preach powerful truths. Anointed with power, they went forth to preach this gospel and share this gospel with the world. And they made a difference in the world in which they live. They preached this gospel, but he tells them in Matthew 10, 7 and 8, he tells them, as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Even at that time, he says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you have received, freely give. Go out and share this gospel with the world. Take this, take this and share it with the world. The text in Matthew 16 speaks not only of the building of the church, but of the builder himself, which was Jesus Christ, Sister Nadine, because it was established on the knowledge that Peter had that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. The church, now this is a point I want to make, I want to get across to you. The church is the centerpiece of the kingdom of God. You must be in the church and not just belong to the church. You're born into the church. The death, burial, and resurrection that Brother G.L. preaches to us. Genesis records God's creation of the world. He spoke things into existence, Brother Johnny. He created Adam and Eve, and he gave them dominion over everything that he had created. But the church was the only thing that God ever had to buy. The church was the only thing that God ever had to buy. He bought the church, and that means we are precious to him. We are valuable to him. We are the only thing he was willing to pay a price for. No wonder hell hates us or tries to wreak havoc in our life. No wonder hell tries to drive us crazy and tries to steal our faith and the peace of our mind and our spirit because we are the only thing that Jesus Christ ever bought. We are the only thing that he ever bought. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19 says, For as much as ye know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by the tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Acts 20 and 28 says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. <coughs> Paul tells us that we are bought with a price. There was a price that was paid for, for you and I. And it was his own life that he gave. The word bought comes from a Greek word which actually means to be purchased as a, as a slave would be at an auction. I've often said that in Jesus' lifetime that he lived in the shadow of the cross. Everywhere that he went, Sister Judy, that cross was right behind him because he knew what his final fate was going to be. He knew what was going to happen at the end of his life. He knew that Calvary was inevitable. He knew that he was going to have to go to that cross and he was going to have to give his life for us, and he willingly did that. 
He willingly paid for the church with his own life. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, and speaking about the church, says, but you are a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in times, were, in times past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which have not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. I'm here to tell you that each one of you were chosen with a specific plan in mind by God. We, we've often talked about it, Brother Billy. There's, there's different individuals and different people that each one of us can touch in our lives. We all come in contact with different people each and every day. And it's, it, it's our job, Sister Liz, to share this gospel. To tell the people about this gospel that we have. It's our purpose. We've got a purpose. He's got a plan in mind for each one of us. We're here for a reason tonight. I believe that we as the First Pentecostal Church of New Madrid are positioned and placed here for a reason. We are a positioned church that has been placed here, Sister Amanda, by God himself. It's our jobs to reach out to our families. It's our jobs to reach out to our friends and whoever we come in contact with to impact the city that we live in. I believe that's happening right now. I believe that's happening right now. I believe that we are impacting the city in which we live in. But it's up to you and I to make a difference. It's you and I to take this church and share it with the world. Amen? Matthew 16 and 18 says, But I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I began to look at this, and I felt the Lord begin to deal with me about this particular passage right here in this, in, in this deal, and I got, to, I got to looking, and I got to thinking, and prayed a little bit about it, and I thought, well, Lord, what, what are you trying to tell me? But gates are a defensive weapon. Gates are not an offensive weapon. A gate is put up to keep somebody out. Cities in the Old Testament, their walls and their gates were important to them because it kept the enemy out. Their enemy was ever able to get through the gates or get through the wall the city could easily fall because they penetrated it, Brother Shannon. They got into it. They created havoc. But gates are a defensive weapon and not an offensive weapon. That word prevail means to be superior in strength. The word prevail means to be superior in strength. I see that as Jesus telling his church that the gates of hell shall never, never be stronger are superior in strength than the church. The gates of hell shall never be superior in strength to the church of Jesus Christ. It will never be able to gain victory over the church that he built. And we as a church can storm the gates of hell and it will not stop us. It will not stop us. I don't know about you, but that kind of excited me when I began to look at that, study that, and see that, Brother Johnny. Hell itself can't even keep us out. Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave. He took back the keys to the kingdom. It can't stop the church of Jesus Christ. The book of Jude tells us as a church to snatch souls from the fire of hell. And others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Pluck them out. Nikki Cruz was probably one of those that was close to the gates of hell. And because of a preacher, he was snatched away from the gates of hell. How many people that we come in contact with that are that close 
And sometimes we don't even realize it. I'm speaking for myself. I'm not pointing fingers. I'm, I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody else. We get caught up in life. Life happens. We work nine, nine and a half, ten hours a day. We become focused on ourselves. We, and, and I've said it before, we fail to share this gospel with somebody that really, really needs it in their life. Ask the Lord to make me more perceptive to somebody like that. Everybody needs to hear the gospel. Everybody needs to hear the gospel. So don't, don't take me wrong, but I not only want to see my friends and family saved, I want to see your friends and family saved. For the same purpose, the church, the saints of God are the body of Christ. It's his desire that he lives within each one of us. And when he does that, we become the house of God. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22 says, Now, therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation or a dwelling place of God through the Spirit. How many of you fight battles? We all fight battles. Brother Mark, I fight battles. But we have, we have a promise within the Scripture that God will never leave us nor forsake us. We have promise within the Scriptures, and I got a few Scriptures, just bear with me. I got several Scriptures that I want to read right now that tells us that we are not by ourselves. That we've got a God that will fight with us, and we have a God that will fight for us. Because this is his church, Brother Dole. He's going to fight for us. One of the scriptures that Brother GL told us to memorize, and I've got it on my phone, and I, I read it quite often. I put it in my notes on my, on my phone. It says, when thou goest out to battle against thine enemy, Deuteronomy 21 through 4. When thou goest out to battle against thine enemy, and seest horses and chariots, and a people more than thou. Be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be when you are come nigh unto battle, that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people, and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint, fear not, and do not tremble. Neither be ye terrified because of them. For the Lord your God... Is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. He goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Not to let anything harm you. Not to let you go down in defeat, but to save you. 2 Chronicles 20, 15 through 17 says, And he said, Hearken ye all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat, Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismay by the reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow go ye down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz, and you shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves. Stand ye still and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. When you go to battle, I'm going to be with you. When you fight the enemy, I'm going to be with you. When you come up against things that you cannot conquer on your own, I'm going to be with you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to fight for you. Isaiah 54 and 17 says... No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise up against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Not only will God fight for us, he's left us the ability to arm ourselves in the fight also, because there's going to be battles that you and I are going to have to fight. Excuse me, my throat's getting a little sore. I, uh, several others are the same way. But I got a word from God tonight. I got a word from God. I believe that. I come over. I come over 
Last night I told him at Monday night at prayer meeting that I was just, I was struggling. I had a thought. Sometimes, Brother Billy, I get a thought, and it's kind of hard to put it together. And I, I kept saying, well, I'll just teach something else. I'll just go somewhere else. I'll, I'll do something else. It kept coming back to this, Brother Johnny. It kept coming back to this. I got a, a, a bunch of Sunday school books that we had that we teach out of, and it's called the Church Alive series. And every one of them that I would open to would come to part of this that I'm using tonight. I come over here last night at the church and began to pray and worked on my lesson. I went over to Brother GL's office and began to rummage through his books. I'll tell him I was in there peripheral around. But everything that I picked up, I picked up a couple books and everything kept coming back to this. And I thought, this is it, you know. But stupid me, I, I, I walked away from it again. And I went over here into the other church part of the building over here where there was a box of books sitting there. And I got to thumb through them. And in the bottom, I showed Sister Stacy this. And in the bottom of it was a book by Brother Jeff Arnold. And it says, I will build my church. Lord talking to me, Brother Terry. He said, I will build my church in just about everything that I turn to. And it excites me. I've got chill bumps right now. But everything I turn to applied to what I've been teaching, what I've been thinking, was able to put it together. But we are the church. We are the church, the blood-bought church, the victorious church, the glorious church, the conquering church, a church that is positioned where God wants us to be. Where God wants us to be. Don't get discouraged. Don't get down because God's on our side. He is on our side. 2 Timothy 2, 3, and 4 says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who had chosen him to be a soldier. God's chosen us to fight in this battle. God has chosen us to fight in this battle. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5, and I read it earlier, says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Everything that comes up against us, everything that we face, we can pull it down. We can pull down the strongholds that stand in the way because we have the knowledge of who God is, just as Peter did. Paul tells us that there's going to be often times that we have to fight a battle. Not only do we, not only do we fight the flesh, but we battle, battle emotions and we, we battle uh, the spiritual world that, that, that is real. It's a real place. Uh, the spirit of oppression and the spirit of depression that attacks people. I think that's one of, one of the greatest enemies that the devil uses today is depression. If you can get, if you can get, he gets you depressed and down thinking that I have no hope. And he can get you, Sister Joy. He uses that against us. Ephesians 6 is a very familiar passage of Scripture, and I want to touch on some of these weapons that God gave us to fight with in closing the night. But Ephesians 6, 10 through 18 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Notice he says again, the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with a preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying always with prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplications for all saints. Now, Brother Billy, a military soldier will never, ever remove his uniform or his protective armor 
while he's in battle. He'll never take his uniform off or his protective armor while he's fighting in battle because it distinguishes, number one, who he is by the uniform that he has on. And his armor is for protection against the enemy that he's fighting against. It would be foolish for a soldier to go out without body armor on, without his helmet on, without some form of protection. He's just asking for trouble if he does that, but he arms himself with what the military provides for him. The same way, the same way that you and I have to arm ourselves with this spiritual armor that's listed in Ephesians chapter 6. The military always has a battle plan. Before going into battle, they study their enemy. They know their strengths and they know their weaknesses and they devise a plan to attack them. And it's the same way for the church. The Bible tells us that we are not ignorant of his devices. 2 Corinthians 2 and 11 says, Lest Satan should get an advantage on us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We know how he attacks. We know what he does. We know how he fights. We as a church are not blind to the fact that the devil does not want to see us succeed. Amen? He does not want to see us succeed, and he's going to work on us any way that he can because he knows our weaknesses and he knows our strengths. Why? Because we revealed it to him, Sister Jessica, many times. He knows where he can come against us at. That's why the scripture tells us, and I believe it's a book of James, to resist the devil and he will flee from you. Stand up and he will flee from you. I've often said that he doesn't play fair. The devil don't play fair. It's his desire to destroy us. Jesus told Peter in Luke 22, 31 through 32, he says, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan had desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. He said, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. Peter played a very important part of the early church. He preached the gospel message, Brother Robbie, not only to the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, but he's saying, they preached the same message to Cornelius' household in Acts chapter 10. It was the same gospel message. Why? Because there was, no, there was no variances in them. The same man preached the same message, and he was very important in the early church. Paul's first instructions in Ephesians 6 is, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The phrase, be strong, comes from a Greek word meaning to be continually strengthened are renewed over and over and over again in the Lord. We cannot allow ourselves to become weak. Philippians 4.13 tells us that I can do all things through Christ which strengthened me. I know where my strength comes from. When I'm weak, then am I strong because I've got him on my side. He tells us to put on the whole armor of God. Do not leave any of it off. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the tricks of the devil. Paul lists for us five defensive weapons and one offensive weapon. The belt of truth. The belt of truth was named after the leather belt with an apron that hung in front of a Roman soldier's groin in his lower abdomen. The belt or girdle was very important because it held all the other parts of the armor together. Everything was fastened to the belt and it held everything together. Together To gird your loins in the Bible days, Brother Billy meant to draw up and tie the lower part of your garment between your legs to increase mobility and agility to be able to run and to be able to move. And we know that the truth of the gospel is the foundation on which we are saved. He tells us to buy the truth and sell it not. The truth is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The truth will set us free. It's the truth of the knowledge of who God is. The breastplate of righteousness. The second time a breastplate breastplate was a type of chain or mail uh, constructed by linking small metal rings together until it formed a vest. 
It was often formed or molded to conform to the body and to provide a protection to the vital organs such as the heart and the lungs. Now Webster's Dictionary defines righteousness as integrity or purity of the heart. When used in the scriptures, it means to make right before God, keeping a life that is right before God, if you will. When you stop and think about a breastplate, Brother Johnny, it's covering the heart. It's covering the vital organs of the body. Proverbs 4 and 23 tells us to keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Matthew 15, 18, and 19 says, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man, for out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. The breastplate provided protection for the heart, the lungs, and the intestines, and other vital organs. In Jewish thinking, the heart represented the mind and the will, and the bowels represented the emotions and the feelings, and he's telling us that we need to guard these things with the breastplate of righteousness. It's Satan's goal to attack what we know is right in our hearts. If he can plant seeds of discord, if he can plant seeds of discouragement or, or hatred or envy in our hearts, then it, then it will grow when he tries to upset the emotional balance of our lives, causing us to be discouraged. That's the way that he attacks. The third thing was having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The studded stoves enabled the soldiers to stand firm. They kept the soldiers' feet from slipping in battle. Without his shoes, a Roman soldier could not maintain his position against the enemy. Wherefore, taking you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Now, in Paul's time, the Roman soldiers wore a pair of heavy, thick-soled shoes, or, or like sandals, if you will, with straps on them that secured it to the foot, foot, and they were tied up on the legs. And on the bottom of the soles were little spikes that protruded out of the bottom of the soles. And the purpose of that, they were little pieces of metal that stuck out like spikes, and it gave the soldiers, Brother Billy, better traction while they were traveling or while they were fighting in battle so they would not lose their footing, so they would not fall, so they would be secure in battle because a lot of the fighting with the enemy was done up close. It was hand-to-hand -hand combat, and their feet, their, their shoes were very important to them. If they lost their traction or their footing, it would result in death. The enemy would often place razor-sharp stakes in the past that they knew the soldiers would take and hoping of them stepping on it and affecting their feet because if they could not walk, if they could not march, if they could not be able to stand still and fight on a secure ground, then they would lose the battle. The covering of the feet was personal. We're to cover our feet with the preparation or with the readiness before we go to fight because Paul tells us, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and sometimes having done all just to stand. Just to be able to stand. Our suits provide us with an opportunity to take this gospel and share it with the world. For us to have our feet shod with peace speaks of the peace with God and the peace of God. Sometimes in battle, sometimes in a spiritual battle, sometimes peace makes all the difference in the world. The peace of God that passeth all understanding. To know that, Sister Margaret, I don't understand what I'm going through. I don't understand why I'm fighting or facing. But the peace of God gives us that tranquility or that serene, to be serene. To have that peace to know that everything is going to be all right. Everything is going to be all right. The shield of faith. Iron rims were then fitted along the top and bottom edges and an iron circle was attached to the center of the shield. The colors of the soldier's military unit were sometimes painted on the front of the leather coverings. These shields were made so that a row of soldiers, and I had a PowerPoint presentation of this at one time. These shields were made so that a row of soldiers could interlock their shields together to, perform a, to form a wall that could extend out for more than a mile, then marching side by side by side with their shields in front of them together a form of unity, a unified force. 
and it would make it hard for the enemy to defeat them. Not only would they have it in front of them, the ones behind them would put it over the tops of them to protect them. And the enemy would wrap their arrows in pieces of cloth that had pitch on the end of it. It had been soaked with pitch, and they would light them, and they would shoot them. And upon impact, they would splatter burning pieces, igniting anything that it touched. The soldiers, with their shields locked together, could easily deflect these arrows that were shot at them. It shows us that unity is important within the body of Christ. We fight together. We fight together to be a unified force. The shield of faith, the shield of faith is our first line of defense against the Satan's attacks. Verse 16 tells us, above all, that means possibly meaning to cover the rest of the armor, if you will. If the enemy attacks our faith, which is our knowledge of who Jesus Christ is, then the shield is useless if we don't pick it up and fight with it. We've got, we've got to have it. The Bible tells us without faith is it impossible to please God. Just as the soldiers lock their shields together, we can lock our faith together and draw strength from one another in battle. The last, thing, the last defensive weapon that he gave them was the helmet of salvation. To place it on the head, to protect our minds, to protect... Take the thoughts that come into them. Without, without that, a soldier would suffer a head injury. One of the greatest battles that you and I will ever face is, face is controlling our thoughts. Excuse me for saying it again, but our thoughts, our thoughts, our thoughts determine our actions, or our feelings, and our feelings determine our actions. What we think often never takes place, but it would get us in a place to where we cannot focus on anything else. The only offensive weapon that he gave them was the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. The Word of God. The Roman soldiers used swords which were about 6 to 18 inches in length and were sharpened on both sides so they cut going in and coming out, used in close hand-to-hand combat. The sword of the Spirit is the only offensive weapon listed in this passage. Hebrews 4 and 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intent of the heart. Will you stand with me? We are the church of God, saints. We're the one that he bled and died for, and we're the ones that he's coming back for. And he has commissioned us as a church to share this gospel with the lost. We have been placed here, as the book of Esther said, for such a time as this. It's, it's, our, it's our duty and it's our job to share this gospel.